Whenever I have opportunity, when Brother Bill's away, we've been working through the book of James, and we're in chapter 2 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. If you do not, we'll have uh, the Scripture references uh, on the screens. Let's take a look at this first slide. Righteous works. Now when you look at this, before you check out on me, okay, we're not going to spend time this morning doing mathematical equations, okay? The point of us being here this morning is not algebra. But if you were in a class and you were given this question, and you simply wrote x equals 10 at the bottom, what would happen? You wouldn't get credit for it, right? You always have to show your work. Look, look at this next slide. Now, if you wrote this as a response to solving for x, you would receive credit. Why? You demonstrated that you understood the principles, the mathematical principles for solving this equation. You demonstrated that competency. You demonstrated you had understanding and learning. The things that you had been taught in class, you're demonstrating that, that you know how to do that. This is part of James' point in chapter 2 as we're looking, beginning at verse 14, when he says that faith without works is dead. He's challenging us to consider the fact that we have to show our work. And it's not so much the fact that we have to, it's that it, we will. It will just happen. This is the way it is with showing our righteous works when it comes to saving faith. Showing righteous work outwardly demonstrates the saving faith that our Heavenly Father has worked into us. Paul told the Philippians to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to do His good pleasure. This is what we're going to be taking a look at, at least the first part. Just kind of as a reminder, if we look at the different tests or results that we've looked at so far, this morning we'll be looking at this fifth response or this fifth test, but the first one was how do we respond to trials as believers? What does that look like in our lives? What is a trial? And then follow that up in chapter 1 also by temptation. How do we respond to temptations? And then when we hear the truth of God's Word, what does that look like in a believer's life? And then a few weeks back, we looked at impartial love or favoritism in the church. And now we're looking at this topic of righteous works. In this fifth test of a true believer, James focuses on righteous works that flow from saving faith. So what are righteous works? Well, I think initially they need to be defined as repentance, which is followed by obedience. Being a believer in Jesus Christ means not only that we repent of our sin and that we trust in Him as our Savior, but it means that we do the things that He has told us to do. Righteous acts are an, an outworking of our faith. The truth that James emphasizes in this text is that whatever we do reveals who we are. We've heard several times Brother Bill talk to us about the pressures of life that come and when we're squeezed and when we're put in situations that are difficult. Who we really are inside is what comes out. It's what's demonstrated. And James isn't talking about a, a, a belief or intentions. He's talking about foundational belief and actions of saving faith. So we're going to take a look at this 
response or this test of righteous works in two different headings in this particular content. So James deals with this idea and introduces this idea of our response to righteous works. And the first is a false faith. He also calls this a dead faith, and we'll look at this uh, in, in three different parts as we move through verses 14 to 20. So let's look at this passage again that we read. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for the body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Here again we see James just hitting head on. He doesn't skirt around any issue doesn't take anything kind of half-heartedly or casually. He just assaults this head on. Jesus repeatedly emphasized in, in, the, in the Gospels and this basic truth that just an intellectual assent, just an understanding or just a saying that we understand is not divine truth. It does not bring forth salvation. In Matthew chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 16, grapes are gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. As many times uh, in, in history, the church, even more so today, needs to recognize that just an acknowledgement of who Jesus is or who God is, is not saving faith. Sometimes in some circles, we even get this idea that as long as you say that you don't, if you say that you don't believe in God, that's one thing. But if you just don't say that, then you are saved. You have saving faith. And that's not what James is talking about here at all. James will not permit that type of falsehood um, to be unchallenged. How we live proves who we are or who we are not in God's sight. And James states in, in, in verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 22, genuine believers are doers of the word, not hearers only. It can't be stressed also too much that no one can be saved by works. Salvation, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, is by grace through faith. If works would have any part of salvation, our, our initial coming to Christ in faith, then it would no longer be by God's grace. So that, that point remains. And James isn't arguing a different point. But it's just as important, James declares, that faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Genuine transformation and genuine transforming faith not only should, but will produce genuine good works or righteous works. When, when we experience saving faith, God imparts His Holy Spirit into us and He takes our dead spirit and makes that alive. 
That's, that's why this term came about of a new birth. We are born again. Not of flesh and blood, but of the Spirit. And James' point here is, we can't say that we have God's Spirit living within us that causes us to repent and to believe in faith. And then at the same time say that that Spirit is not effectual enough to cause us to behave like Christ. That can't happen. You, you, the Spirit doesn't come and bring one and then disappear and no longer lives within us to produce the other. It has to be there. This is what the new nature or the new creation at new birth looks like. It will certainly not be perfect obedience. <laughs> if you have just begun this life of obedience to Christ, or if you've been on this path for decades, it will still not be perfect obedience. In no way. But as God's Spirit that's imparted to us, giving us the ability to, to repent and to believe, to confess our sin is the exact same spirit that's going to cause us and work in us to begin looking like Christ, to begin acting like Christ. And that's James' point. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And James kind of works through this in three different ways perspectives, if you, if you will. One is an empty confession in verse 14. Again, he says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? The key to understanding this section lies right here in this first part of this verse. What use is it, my brethren? Again, we see this heart of love and compassion passion that, that James has for these readers. If someone says he has faith but has no works, can that faith save him? We're not talking about someone that actually does have this faith. He says specifically if someone says that he has this faith but then doesn't live like Christ, can that faith save him? If it could, then that means we don't need Christ's death on the cross in order to come to him initially in, in what we would call... I may have to get that other mic. We'll, uh, we'll try this for just a little bit. If the works would save me, then me coming to Christ initially, repenting of my sin, seeing the cross for what it is, that he died for me, understanding for the first time in my life what that love looks like. If the works would save me, then I don't need that. I don't need the cross. And the way that James poses this question is, it, 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 it demands a negative response. No, it cannot. In Romans chapter 2, Paul says, He will render to each one according to his works, to those who who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and, Im and immorality, he will grant eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey righteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Next slide. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For it is not the hearer of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves even though they don't have the law. They show that the work of the law was written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men 
by Jesus Christ. So are, are, are James and Paul saying two different things? No. They're fighting common enemies. They're not facing each other trying to argue two different points. So here we have Paul who's opposing works righteousness and legalism. And we have James opposing something that might be an easy, easy believism. I just, I just have to say that I, that I believe and therefore I believe. Here we have saving faith and righteous works that are at the core of both. So these aren't antagonistic one to another. Paul opposes works righteous legalism and James opposes easy believism. In John chapter 5, we see, Do not marvel at this, Jesus said, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. <laughs> Does that even cause you to want to shout? <laughs> Does that stir up anything in you? Oh my goodness. The tombs will hear his voice, they will come forth, those who did good deeds to resurrection of life, to those who committed evil deeds, to a resurrection of judgment. Paul describes here in the clearest possible way, and we referenced this just a little bit earlier in Ephesians chapters 2, verses 8 and 9. So after declaring, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. He follows that up immediately for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There is true salvation where sovereign grace reaches down to regenerate, to transform. And God will create in the spirit of that person new longings to forsake sin and self. And I don't know what your experience was, but I grew up in church and as soon as I got out of high school, that was it for me. Now I would have told you that I was a believer. But if you, if you took any of these concepts and applied them to my life, you would have seen very clearly that I was not. Why? I didn't live that way. I didn't live like Christ. I didn't live under his lordship. I did whatever I wanted to do, whatever I thought was right, in my own eyes. Somebody invited me to church when I moved to Purcell, and I went, and from that moment on, things were different. From that moment on, I desired to be with the people of God. I desired to sing. <laughs> and Josh will tell you, I, I, I don't, I'm not a singer. <laughs> okay. But I desired to sing praises to God. All of a sudden, I started studying His Word. I had never studied the Bible. I had memorized some passages, right? I'm just growing up in church. That's what you do. Things were very different for me from that point on. Your story may be similar, maybe completely different. But there is a change that happens when we are brought from death to life. You can't expect a dead man to act the same as a, a man that's alive. It's inconceivable, and that's James's point. In, in this example and, and in others, this idea is continued on here in chapter 2, in verse 15. His second point is, faith without works is like compassionate words without actions. And here he, in, in verses 15 to 17, he says, If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, 
And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Seeing, and this, this passage speaks of a, of a couple of things. One is, it's a brother or sister. So this is a person that is of faith, right? This is a brother or sister. And they're without clothing and in need of daily food. This isn't something that just, just kind of come up all of a sudden. This is, this is something that's more known. There's someone here that needs help with daily food and clothing. And he asked the question, if you say to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, but you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? I can say that I have saving faith. I can say to a person, be warm and be filled. But what does the Spirit of God cause me to do? It causes me to look like Christ. Christ didn't look at the hillside of the multitudes that were, that were without a sheep without a shepherd. And he didn't say, Oh, those poor, lonely people. That's not... He felt for them. He had compassion on them. And then what did he do? He died for them. He died for all those who believe. So what use is it? And this is almost an, an outrageous comment to say, go and be filled. When I have the means to help you to be warm, I have the means to help you to have food, and yet I say, God's blessing be upon you. May you be filled and may you be warm. It's no use at all. Just as professed compassion without kindness is phony, so also is faith, which has nothing more than empty claims. James looked, looks at this as a, a, from a third perspective, a shallow conviction in verses 18 to 20. But someone may say, may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? James is saying that you can claim to have faith, and, and nothing else is necessary. That your faith can stand by itself. But the truth is, you cannot show me your faith without the works, without any practical evidence or outworking of it. You cannot demonstrate that kind of faith because there is nothing to demonstrate it with. Living faith will produce fruit, will produce its nature, its purpose. Dead faith does not because it cannot. Probably about a year and a half ago or so, I was summoned. I got a note in the mail that I was on. I had jury duty. Have you ever gotten one of those? It's scary. And your first thought is, is I wonder if I can get out of this. And the answer is most likely no. <laughs> you have to go. So I showed up downtown. You don't know where to park. You get into this massive room and they start calling people's names. Well, I got through the first day. So I was thinking I may not have to do this. Second day, they called my name. Walk us upstairs, escort us into a courtroom where people are standing there, and they begin asking us questions. And they seat the jury. And I ended up as one of 13. The 
12 with one alternate. And this happened to be a young man that was accused of murder. So what did the prosecution do? They called eyewitnesses. They called a medical examiner. They called a ballistics expert. They brought in evidence, video evidence, physical evidence. They even brought in a person that had overheard this young man confessing to the murder. So what did the defense do? They didn't call any witnesses. And there wasn't very much cross-examination that happened at all. So when we began to deliberate, what were we looking for? Were we looking for the fact that somebody said they did something or said they didn't do something? We were looking for proof. We were combing the cell phone records that had been presented to us. We were reviewing and re looking at our notes on the testimonies that had been given. We, we were looking for proof of innocence or proof of guilt. That's what, that's what we were trying to sift through. Here James tells us, I will show you my faith by my works. If you want to know that I've had a saving encounter with Jesus Christ, the one true living God, and that he has imparted his spirit in me, if you want to, if you want to show proof of that, it's going to be by how I live. If God has truly imparted his spirit in me, I can live no other way. I, can, I may deny that for a time, and I may have times where I'm struggling with obedience or I'm struggling with sin. and I'm, it, There may be times when that happens. And, and we've already said it's not going to be perfect obedience at all. But nevertheless, it will be obedience. I will have to move down that path. Why? Because God's Spirit is living within me. I, I, I can't. I can't make that be any other way. For some of you that are older, have you looked back and caught yourself doing things that your parents did? Maybe even sometimes stuff that you said you wouldn't do <laughs> when you grow up? Why, why do you do those things? It's because it's who you are. And regardless of whether it was how you were raised or just kind of a genetic thing, That's just who you are. And James is saying, I will show you my faith by my works. Now, just as a side note here, it is for that reason that just because you've had some type of a religious experience and you may have a specific date and time, that is not necessarily proof that you've received the Spirit of God in your life. I can have an experience and know a date and a time. And that doesn't mean that that's changed my life. The only certain proof of life after, of life lived after an experience is this proof of righteous works that James is talking about. A fruitless life is certain proof that it, that life does not belong to God. This life is unacceptable to God because it does not have His divine life within it. Next, James shifts focus to a flourishing faith. He contrasts this flourishing faith or living faith with what he has just described with false or dead faith. James gives living illustrations of living faith. Now, before we explore this passage, you may be here this morning and you are not feeling that you could possibly be worth anything to God. You may be here this morning and you may be knowing who you are in your past or Whatever's happened to you that 
You don't see any way that God could use you in His plan at all. You might even be thinking, <laughs> look how old I am. I mean, I'm, I'm too old. If we look at this passage, just look down there through verses 21 through 26. Who are the examples that, that James pulls out to demonstrate this flourishing, living faith? Just kind of look through there. Whose names come out? One, Abraham. Who's the other one? Rahab. Now before we get into this, just think through this. Who is Abraham? Well, we certainly know some of the amazing things that God accomplished in his life and through him. But he was also a worshiper of idols before God called him. Remember he lied about his wife? He doubted God. He doubted God so much that when God expressed a proclamation of what was going to happen and what God was going to do through him, he literally laughed out loud. <laughs> like this, you, you got to be kidding. Rahab, she was a Gentile. The first part of her name was she was named after an Egyptian god, Ra. She was a prostitute. So before we even get into these two examples, regardless of where you are today, regardless of how worthy or unworthy you think you may be, regardless of how washed out you think you are, regardless of your past, regardless of your age, take courage. This living faith that is imparted to us through God's Spirit, who resides in us, will produce fruit. God will use you. I was told many, many years ago, if you will just be available, God will wear you out. Just be available. Let's take a look at this first example. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working in his works. As a result of the works, faith was perfected, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that man is justified by works and not just faith alone. James was not contradicting the doctrine of salvation by faith. He was not dealing with the means of salvation, which is this first part where we initially are drawn to Christ and see the cross and understand that love and understand that sacrifice and that Jesus died for me. But rather, he's looking at its outcome, the evidence that it is has genuinely occurred. After establishing that the absence of good works proves that a professed faith is not real, James now emphasizes the truth that genuine salvation will be demonstrated outwardly in the form of righteous deeds. James says that the father of the faithful, here in his example of, of Abraham, whose very life was a gift of God, was nevertheless justified by works. Is he contradicting himself yet again? It's important to understand this word justified. I, I don't read Greek, but I, it's up there in parentheses if, if you happen to know what that word means. This word is translated a couple of different ways. One is acquittal declaring and treating a person as righteous. And we see that in those passages there in Romans. The other way that this is translated is vindication or proof of that righteousness. And we see that used in Romans, 1 Timothy 3, Luke chapter 7, verse 35. 
So there's two ways that this word justified has to be understood. One is declaring righteous. The other is proof. So the best way I could try to figure out this graphic, this is, this is what James is saying. Saving faith will always produce righteous works. Righteous works prove saving faith. They go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. If you say you have saving faith, but you don't have righteous works, it's dead faith. If you say you have righteous works, but you don't have saving faith, you can't, because it always proves that you have saving faith. It was when Abraham offered up Isaac, James says, that the whole world could perceive the reality of his faith. That is, it was genuine rather than counterfeit. Obedient rather than deceptive. Living rather than dead faith. When a man is justified before God, he will always prove that justification before others. You see that faith was working in his works. And as a result, his faith was perfected. The second example that James gives to illustrate is Rahab. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot who, just, who also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Verses 25 and 26. Rahab the harlot is listed with Abraham in the great gallery of the faithful in Hebrews chapter 11. <laughs> Do you see how this is encouraging this morning? <laughs> Certainly we have some topics that we need to work through and think through. And also, Rahab was in the human lineage of Jesus, being the great-grandmother of David. As reported in Joshua chapter 2, Rahab was an innkeeper in Jericho, and when Joshua and the men came into the city, she hid them. Lied to the officials, said, they've gone out, you need to go with them, you should go chase them down. Soon as they were gone, she came back. She had a discussion with these guys made a deal with them. Rahab not only acknowledged that the God of Israel was the true Lord, she also trusted in Him. Although she knew nothing of salvation that we would understand today, her heart was right before the Lord and He accepted her faith. What did she have on the line here? For that matter, what did Abraham have on the line when he went up to offer Isaac? When the chips are down, when what's going to happen counts, when you're placed in a situation that means something, you will not be able to deny the faith. God's Spirit rises up within us to cause us to look like Christ. For the last 49 weeks, we've been looking at the persecuted church around the world, moving our way from number 50 all the way up to number 1, which will be next week, and then the following week will culminate that entire process with the day of prayer. What causes those believers when their families are hauled out and they're told if you do not deny your Jesus Christ we will kill your family that's the part that they'll never ever understand we're studying on Sunday nights right uh, justification by faith alone <laughs> 
What caused Martin Luther to say, I, I cannot recant? can't. We will never obey perfectly. But we can never run far enough or hide ourselves well enough to get away from the Spirit of the living God that lives inside of a true believer. When Rahab had an opportunity to demonstrate her trust in the Lord, she placed her life on the line. Had her actions been discovered by the king, she and her family would have been executed for treason. Abraham and Rahab were supremely committed to the Lord, whatever the cost. True and a true faith unfailingly reveals itself. Long before Jesus' crucifixion, Abraham and Rahab were willing to take up their crosses, as it were, and follow him. James is saying, you must and you will show your work. Your righteous works is proof that you have flourishing or living faith. So the question that, for me, comes from this passage, have I committed my life to following Christ? If I have, have I seen living proof of righteous works? Not something that I have to try to fight and conjure up, because I promise you, <laughs> we, we, we've seen this not too awful long in our Bible studies and in, in, in our Sunday school. If God wants you in Nineveh, where will you be? You will be in Nineveh. How you get there, you may have some say in the matter. Because he could have gone by boat, but he ended up going by a big fish who vomited him up on the shore at Nineveh. This isn't something that I'm going to that I have to try to conjure up myself and work up and and oh my goodness I've this is a an outworking of a desire that God's spirit brings into the person's life. If you have not seen righteous works in your life, please consider the first righteous work of repentance and then submission. To Christ's Lordship. Let's pray. Father, as we have taken a look at this passage, certainly not in depth, it calls to us, how will we respond to righteous works? Do we see them in our lives, being obedient to the call of Christ,